Welcome to Pentecost. These are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, upon all flesh. I got me a good lesson cooked up, but there's a few of us that ain't felt it yet. True worshipers don't wait. Till the time's right. True worshipers don't wait till there's a good song sung. True worshipers don't wait till there ain't no visitors around. True worshipers plan on being a worshiper before they ever get there. Huh? True worshipers. True worshipers. And Clapping your hands, lifting your voice, that's praise. Worship comes from your heart. And it is a, an acknowledgement of what he means to you. Worship was never meant to be a corporate thing that we all do at the same time. I got my lesson, and I'm going there in a minute, but I got to tell you something. When that old gal busted in the house, with a very precious box of precious ointment. Everybody else was grubbing. Everybody else was bellied up to the table. And she elbowed her way in at the feet of Jesus. She broke it, which means I'm giving all of it. I'm not holding nothing back. And she began to wash his feet. I'm, I'm ready for us to go to that level of worship where it's independent of even life itself. If they drop a bomb in St. Louis, it ain't going to hinder my worship. That's where we got to get, Brother Billy, is I'm going to worship him. I don't care if the devil is sitting there. I'm going to worship the Lord. And you fake praise. You can fake praise. Well, you can. Clap your hands a little bit. Say a couple of I love you, thank you, Jesus. But you cannot fake worship. You cannot do it. Because worship's a state of mind. And it comes from inside of you. And all it is is it's a declaration, your declaration of how much he's worth to you. And I do, I'm standing in awe of him tonight. I, I'm just completely amazed. I, Brother Billy, I almost can't worship him because I'm just speechless. He knows the end from the beginning. He told John, he said, I am that is and was and is to come, the Almighty. He knows the end from the beginning. And Brother Pete, I'm learning. When he speaks, just obey him and then sit back and watch what happens. Huh? Amen. It's so good to see you. Oh, Rhonda, it's good to see you back there. You worked hard today? Not that hard. Oh, it, is it not working right? Praise the Lord. Good to see Stephanie here. I can't remember your last name. We had about 15 Stephanies work for us, but it's good to, it's good to have you here. I'll remember it after tomorrow when I do the checks. And it's good to have, you didn't tell me your name, you just told me she was your niece. Suzanne, it's so good to have you here with us. It surely is, and it's good to have Kara, right? Victoria, and the other one went back there. It's good to see Sister Liz back home. Really good to see you back here. Amen. 
Amen. It's so good to see everybody in church tonight. Boy, it's good to feel the presence of the Lord. If we would forget that it was Wednesday night, he might be able to move up in here. Everybody knows he ain't supposed to move on Wednesdays. Huh? He wants to just move all the time. He wants to move in your car with you on the way to work. Man, we got to get out of the way and just let him be God. Just let him be God. Amen. The last time I taught this, I taught it in two parts. I'm not going to teach both parts tonight, so nobody worry. Dominion. We are destined to live lives of dominion. We are winners. We're not losers. We are the head and not the tail. From above and not beneath. We're the apple of his eye. His workmanship. The craftsmanship of his hands. We are destined to win. Behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's us. Destined to win. To be victorious. Because he was victorious. Amen. There are two great challenges in life. Two great challenges that actually are umbrella that cover every obstacle that we face. They are sin and death. This includes everybody. I'm, I'm teaching about having dominion over sin, and this is applicable to everybody under the sound of my voice. Nobody gets to shut me off. Okay? Dominion over sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Sin brought death, which is described as falling short of the glory of God. And the glory of God it's referring here to is the fellowship and relationship that he desires for us. If we could ever comprehend that the Lord desires that as much or more than we do. Something that we feel like every obstacle in the way is hindering us from is what the God of all creation wants. He wants relationship with every one of us. Intimate relationship with each of us. He wants constant communication with us. The bad news is, is all have sinned. The good news is that God loved us so much that he came into the world as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for one purpose, and that was to restore fellowship, to restore relationship. Now, I'll tell you what, I'm going to preach my guts out here tonight, but I need to get an amen or something every now and again, all right? Amen? amen. That's a good job. Praise the Lord. He loved you so much that he robed himself in the likeness of sinful flesh and came into the world to restore relationship. He lived a full life, 33 and one half years, and never sinned, not one time. Not one time. The only man... The only man that never deserved to die was born for that purpose, to die. By virtue of his resurrection, he defeated sin and death. Somebody say it's defeated. He defeated sin and death once and for all. And he offers the salvation that he paid for to us as a free gift to whosoever will. Salvation means deliverance from sin. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection brought salvation or brought deliverance from sin to each one of us. And the death, burial, and resurrection ensure, ensure that sin can never have control over you again. Romans 6 and 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law but under grace now there's a there is a 
cop-out that people like to use. Everybody sins. Right? Everybody sins. Nobody's perfect. Well, I agree with that. I do not agree with everybody sins all the time. Don't agree with it. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to prove to you by the Bible that you don't have to sin every day. Oh, I said something earlier. I said we win. Do you believe that? We win. God grants forgiveness from past sin, deliverance from present sin, and the assurance of victory over future sin, in case there is some. The question we got to ask is, he's made all of this available to us. How do we receive this complete dominion over sin? How can we receive salvation so that we might have dominion over sin? Faith in Jesus Christ is the pathway by which we are led to salvation. But saving faith is much more than an agreement or a confession. It's much more. Come on, please, please don't think I'm being boring tonight. I can't hear myself, so. See, salvation, Brother Billy, is much more than $2 in a good confession. It's much more than just making a public proclamation that I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. It's much more than that. It's much more than an agreement or a confession. However, it does involve both of those things. But they must be followed by trusting in and obedience to Jesus Christ as Lord of all. If you're in a building, if we're in this building, and somebody screams, the building's on fire, you've got two options. Stay there and burn or get out and be saved. But standing there in the middle of the flames declaring you're saved is going to get you a quick trip to the morgue. Okay? You, don't, you cannot just declare it and so be it. The old, we are only assured of salvation from sin and dominion over sin if we respond to the call in obedient faith. In the book of Acts, we are given the proclamation of the plan of salvation as declared by the disciples to the questioning crowd. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That, my friends, is the plan of salvation. The first response of faith, when you believe, your first response must be repentance, which means turning away from sin and turning toward God, confessing our sins to Him and Him alone. You don't owe me no confession. I didn't die for your sins. He died for your sins. Now the Bible does speak of confessing your sins to one another. That's talking about for support. That's not talking about for salvation. And you better, be, you better be careful who you confess it to. Right. 
confessing your sins to God and making a decision to forsake your sins, repentance is death to sin, to self-will, and to the old life. Then after you die, what happens? You must be buried. Paul wrote to the Roman church that we are buried with him in baptism. Romans 6 and 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. After we repent of our sins, we must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. At repentance and water baptism, and I know I'm hurrying, at repentance and water baptism, God forgives our sins, wipes our record clean, and Brother Billy, he is in effect preparing our heart to be filled with his spirit. He's getting rid of the old life, the old me, and the old stuff that caused separation, and he's preparing me to enter back into relationship with him. And this relationship with him has, has very little to do with the commercial aspect of a baby in a manger and swapping gifts at Christmas and hunting eggs at Easter. But it has everything to do with living a life of peace and hope and joy and contentment in the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the most holy God. So we see that baptism is a part of our salvation. It's not by our works, Brother David, but it's by him working in us. So many people try to say, well, you don't have to be baptized because that's being saved by works. That's baloney. That's a misunderstanding of what baptism is. You've got to be baptized according to the Bible to have your sins washed away. Why in the world would people preach a doctrine that we don't have to do something that Jesus Christ himself did and said, go ahead and baptize me because thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Brother McKinney, if you want to be right, you get baptized. Brother Billy, you get baptized in his name. His name. In the early church, in the Bible, book of Acts, People were baptized as soon as they believed on Jesus and repented, regardless of what time it was or where they were or who was around. They were always immersed in water and were always baptized in the name of Jesus to signify burial with him. I don't have it in my notes and I don't have it up there, but Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Acts chapter 8 verse 16, Acts chapter 10 verse 43, Acts chapter 22 verse 16, and Acts chapter 19 verse number 5, every one of them was baptized in the name of Jesus. Every time somebody was baptized in the Bible, they were baptized in Jesus' name. Nowhere, no way, no how was anybody baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was a commandment to baptize. Matthew 28 and 19, it was a commandment to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But John 5 and 43 says, I am come in my Father's name. Matthew 1 and 21 says, you shall bring forth the Son and call his name. Jesus. John 14 26 says, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost who the Father will send in my name. And Acts 4 and 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Say, so you're saying, I'm not saying Jack. I'm telling you what the Bible says. has nothing to do with me. Nothing. It's not my way. It's not my way. But it's his way. And I preached to us Sunday morning. The devil wants to, to deceive us into denying the true plan of salvation. And all it is is in black and white. 
the way the disciples did it, Brother Robbie. Everything I preach is what the disciples did. And they were the ones, Brother Pete, they were the ones told by Jesus that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. When Cornelius' household was filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter number 10, the Bible says they heard them speak with tongues and Peter said the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. It began in an upper room with 120 believers that were obeying the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. It's what the Bible says. Let God be true and every man a liar. Every man a liar. Say, well, you're being, you ain't being all that nice and stuff. You know what? Brother Roger, I'm in war, brother. And it's heaven or hell. I'm not here to try to win friends and influence people. I'm just here to tell people the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm just here to tell you what it's going to take to make it to heaven. I'm just here to tell you what it's going to take to live a life of dominion over sin. And when you get Jesus Christ on the inside of you, the devil flees at the name of Jesus. When you get Jesus Christ working inside of you and operating inside of you, the devils will call special assemblies, if you will, and figure out a way to try to bring you down. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? When you get full of the Holy Ghost, every devil in hell knows who you are. When you get full of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, I'm about ready to move on, but I ain't moving just yet. If you're here and you don't know him through the power of the Holy Ghost, this is your night. If you're here and you've never been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues, tonight's your night. If you're here and you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus in water, it, tonight is your night. Uh, I'm telling you, that's what the book says. Uh, say, well, I don't know if I understand it. I don't know. I'm telling you, it's what the book says. We can take a time out. You can open up your Bible and read it for yourself. Game playing days is over. We're in revival. We're in revival. Souls are being filled. Uh, people are coming in. They're being drawn by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we got to tell them. We got to tell them, Brother McKinney. We got to tell them what to do. Amen. Say, well, you're being tough. That's the same thing I got to do them kids that I love more than I love myself. I got to be tough on them. I can't let them slide. Sister Pam, I can't let them get, if I let them go, I don't love them like I should. Paul told the Galatian church, have, have I therefore become your enemy because I told you the truth? Let me move on. 120 received this promise on the day of Pentecost. The initial sign of this experience was that they began to speak in language they had never been taught as influenced by the power of the Spirit. Peter, Peter followed his relaying of the plan of salvation to them in Acts 2.38 by letting, this, letting them know that this promise was not only to them, but it was also to their children and to all that are... Of, oh, help me right now. 
to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Let's back up and go through it again a little slower. God created man in his image, spiritually, morally, and intellectually. Intellectually. Man was originally sinless with a free will. Adam and Eve made a choice to disobey God. The devil did not make them do anything. He does not have that power. But he's going to try to stop you from coming and being filled with the Holy Ghost. He don't have that power either unless you let him. Everyone now since Adam and Eve sinned is born with a sinful nature. We have the desire to sin and we are under the dominion of sin. The sinful nature leads to sinful actions, which leads to dire consequences. You can't play the game of sin and plan to win. Since everyone is born a sinner, all humanity is under the penalty of death, physical death as well as spiritual death. Romans 6 and 23, the first part says, for the wages of sin is death. James 1 and 15 says, then when lust hath conceived, and that just don't have to do with nasty stuff either. Lust is desire that reigns in your life. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is finished, Lord, help me right now. When sin is done with you, it has wrung you out. It has stripped you down. Then there's death. Say, well, I didn't die. No, I'm talking about death to relationship, death to dreams, death to hopes, uh, death to families. Uh, that Death comes when sin reigns. God came in the flesh. Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh in order to provide salvation in order to reverse the curse and not only loosing us from the dominion of sin, actually turning it around and giving us dominion over sin. See, God is the source of all life, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Colossians chapter 1 says, I taught this Sunday too, all things were created by him and for him. Sin causes separation from God, which leads to death. Physical death, spiritual death, and ultimately an eternal death. The shedding of blood, which is the giving of a life, is the only thing that remits or releases mankind from the penalty of death and separation from God. Since man is created in the image of God, the animal sacrifices, Brother Billy, were insufficient in removing sin. They only offered a rollback or a temporary relief from the effects of sin. Everybody has sinned. Every human being that's ever been born has sinned except for one. No other human, Brother Billy, could be chosen to be the sacrifice for sin because every other human deserved to die in their own right for their own sin. So there had to be a sinless one come, the man, Christ Jesus. Ironically, the only human who never deserved to die came specifically to die. His death became the perfect atonement. That word atonement is broken down from three Roots at one meant. That atonement is bringing two separate parts back together. He was the atonement for our sins as well as the sins of the whole world. Jesus had to die because man's sin 
My goodness. Man's sin and God's holiness would be forever separate. Without some help, which is what grace is, grace is help. Grace helps me get to where I cannot get by myself. Without help, man cannot reach a place holy enough to be with God. Say, well, I don't know if I believe that. You ask them fellas that one time a year, one day, the day of atonement. Brother Robbie, you ask them what it takes to get to be in the presence of the Lord. They had bells on the bottom of their robes and a rope tied around them, Brother David, because if there was sin in their life, they were dead. You could not go into the presence of the Lord with one iota of sin. That's why he made the sacrifice before he went. Lacey, that's what we're talking about, praying through the tabernacle. He went to the brazen altar, and he made a sacrifice for himself. And then he went and washed himself. And the mirrors were so the priest could look and make... God, help me right now. The priest could look at himself and make sure that everything was like it was supposed to be, which is what we do in the Word of God. We look at ourselves in the Word of God. And then he would make his way to the golden candlestick, the table of shoe bread, the altar of incense. Very carefully following order and a set pattern and doing everything the right way. Because if anything was done wrong and he entered into the presence of the Lord, he would be struck dead. Oh, it happened. How many heard of a fellow named Uzzah? The Ark of the Covenant was about to tilt over. And he reached out and grabbed it, doing a good thing. And because he touched it unworthily, he fell dead. Read it. It's in the book. It upset David. David got upset at the Lord for killing that man. But the Lord didn't, doesn't play around with his presence. That's why he sent the man, Christ Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential to our salvation because without the resurrection, death won. Because of his resurrection, we have everlasting hope. Come on, y'all stay with me now. Come on. We have everlasting hope in this life. Because of the resurrection, we have everlasting hope in this life. And we have the assurance of eternal life in the life to come. All because he got up. All because he arose. We cannot save ourselves. Now I know Peter said in Acts 2 and 40, Save yourself from this untoward generation. That was not provide yourself salvation. That meant obey what the scripture says. We cannot be good enough to be saved. I don't want to upset you, but coming to church all the time, don't save you. Giving in an offering, paying your tithes, don't save you. Picking up every hitchhiker you pass, don't save you. Giving away all your money to poor folks, don't save you. We can only be saved by the atonement of Jesus Christ. We can only be saved by the atoning actions of Jesus Christ, which was his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Therefore, it is in the likeness of his atoning work that we can receive salvation for our souls which is death, burial, and resurrection. Saving faith means to truly believe on Jesus Christ includes believing his word. Truly believing his word includes obedience. We cannot separate saving faith from obedience.
Obedience, I want you to hear this right now. Obedience to God's word is necessary for salvation. Acts 5 and 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now, I didn't put it in my notes, but in 33, you don't have to put it there because I want to show them how smart I am. Brother, no, I'm just telling you. In 33, as soon as Peter said he gives it to them that obey him, they said, we're going to kill these guys. It's in the book. It's against our nature to submit, Brother Billy. That's why it's so important that we do submit. Please, don't, don't misunderstand me. Think I'm being ugly. There's a ton of good people in the world, but this business of being saved and there being no change didn't come from the book. I got a buddy, he ain't been to church since Moby Dick was a sardine. Maybe one or two times. He's been married one time. He's been with well over 100 different women in his life. He got saved eons ago before I ever knew him. He got saved. I use that term loosely. He got saved. He visited here at church with me a few times throughout our, our friendship. Really liked what he felt. He even, he said, I even thought about starting to tell people I was Pentecost. I argued and argued and argued, well, not, not really argued, I just sat there because I'm dumbfounded, that according to his mother, he's still saved, even though he's been living like the devil. So I come home one time and I said, Daddy, because Daddy was still alive at this time, I said, Daddy, what in the world is going on with people that think they can get saved and then live like the devil the rest of their life and still go to heaven. Well, Daddy was raised up that way. I'm not going to say what way it was, but he was raised up that way. And he said, here's what you ask them. Because once you get saved, you can't never be unsaved. Ever, ever, ever. Daddy said, here's what you ask them. What happens if you, don't, if you decide you don't want to be saved no more? What if you just up and decide, I'm not being saved? Is the Lord going to drag you to heaven kicking and screaming? Oh, you're going to be saved whether you want to or not. Huh? Makes sense. Because my buddy wasn't even sure he wanted to be that religion anymore. But he was saved. If you don't believe me, ask his mama. And I'm not, I'm not being ugly. Y'all understand I'm not being ugly. When you truly get saved, you get saved from something for something. Nobody that's drowning in the ocean gets the life preserver and then tells the fellas, I holler at y'all later, I'm good. <laughs> but they grab on for dear life and say, get me out of here. Get, that's right, Brother Billy. When, when the boat pulled up to you, you didn't tell them, no, I'm good now. No, when you get saved, you're saved from something. Say, I don't know if I believe that. Let me prove it to you. Thou shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And you get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you will not be the same. You will not be the same. The gospel. Romans 6 and 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. 
I used to serve sin. My members used to serve sin. My hands, my eyes, my nose, my ears, my mouth, my legs, my feet, we did sinful things together. But since I got the Holy Ghost, I've still done them. But guess what? I was miserable. And I couldn't wait, Brother Shannon, until I get somewhere to get clean again. Couldn't wait to repent. Sometimes I was repenting in the middle of it. The thing is, is when you get full of the Holy Ghost, you're the light of the world. And the light illuminates. And you know, and you know, and you're standing there at that tree with the option to tell the devil to go fly a kite. And if you tell him to, he's got to. He's got to. God in mercy. You're not destined to lose. You were created to win and then you fell and Jesus Christ came and lived and died and rose again so we can get back to winning. That's all it boils down to is it's the death, the burial, and all the resurrection that gives me hope again. For the gospel, I'm, I'm winding it up. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, this is the gospel I preach to you. I've said this a bunch. I'm going to use it again and again and again. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. By which also ye are saved, if you keep in your mind, in memory, what I preached unto you, unless you believed with nothing to it. Oh, goodness gracious, have mercy. Unless you believed in vain, unless you believed and stopped. Unless you believed and just said, I, you know, most miserable person in the world is somebody that believes and won't do it. Oh, Lord. Unless you have believed in vain, but it's the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. It's the same God. Lord, have mercy. Think about this just for a minute. Man, I know I'm covering a lot of stuff. But Paul said, this is the, I deliver the same gospel I received. This is the same gospel that Paul said, if me or an angel from heaven come preaching any other gospel than that which you've heard, let him be accursed. Okay, let him be accursed. There's just one gospel. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the gospel of GL. But fortunately, it's the gospel which I preach. And I just read it straight from the book. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Dominion over sin is ensured by obedience to the gospel which results in a new birth. It results in a fresh start. The ability to stay full of the Holy Ghost and thereby never being a slave to sin again. Now here's his plan for you. Here's the plan of God for you. Now I'm telling you what, I'm shooting some of this easy believism every day's Friday salvation all to pieces tonight. I'm really doing a good job. Amen. 
There. Thank you, Brother Billy. Ooh. I was getting worried there for a minute. Actually, I'm not sure how good I'm preaching. I'm only hearing about half of it. The plan, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the plan was that everybody that got filled with the Holy Ghost wouldn't sin no more. Because they would realize the power that's within them. Now, we have schooled people to believe that it's all right to sin a little bit because everybody does it. Okay? We have schooled people to do that. That's not in the book. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1 says, Now, do not think that I'm, I'm fixing to prove to you. Don't think that I'm preaching that if you mess up, you're doomed to hell. I'm not preaching that. I believe grace is strong as anybody. Let me tell you something. I am a living testimony to the grace of God. Because if he would have gave up on me as many times as I gave up on myself, I wouldn't be here today. If he would have even gave up on me one time that I thought he did. I've been there before, Brother Pete. I, I couldn't see any way how he could still love me. There's no way. Brother Whippy, I was going back to the father's house just like the prodigal. If they'll just come let me sit on the back row. I'll give an offering. I'll pay my tithes. I'll come to every work day. I'll scrub the commodes, whatever. Huh? That's the way we feel. My little children, I write these things to you that you sin not. You don't have to. But, I love this next part. Not that I plan on sinning. Because, Brother Billy, y'all understand this in the context which I'm saying. The more you pray and the more you fast, the harder it gets to mess up. Huh? The more you go to church. Brother Mark, can I tell them what you told me today? Brother Mark called me today. Said he wrestled with calling me. I want you to know I put on the internet to a preacher's forum my own about you witnessing to a state representative candidate. I want you to know that too. <laughs> Mr. Burleson, was that who it was? Came, he came by Brother Mark's house. He invited him to church. <laughs> Witness to him. He said, before I knew it, it was already coming out. I was already witnessing to it. <laughs> Did he good? Yeah, well, if he comes to church, then y'all already be friends. <laughs> brother, brother Mark called me today. And he said, Brother GL, I just want to tell you something. I've really been enjoying this church we've been having. Because, see, some of y'all don't know, we had prayer meeting Monday night. And then I got crazy in the Holy Ghost. The Lord would not leave me alone. I tried my best to talk him out of it. Tuesdays is one of my free nights, Brother David. Every other Tuesday, I go with you one Tuesday, and then the next Tuesday I get to take off. The Lord said, you need to have prayer service again. I said, I don't want to. Kind of, not really. But, but he got the idea. And finally, I just agreed that I would come pray. That'll be all right, won't it, Lord? No, the Lord said, no, we're going to have prayer meeting. I said, okay, I'll tell them. We had more come back Tuesday night than we had here Monday night. If I'm lying, I'm dying. We had more people here for 30, 32, 33, 34, something like that showed up Tuesday night. We only had 30, 31 Monday night. Weak crowd. <laughs> Brother Mark tells me, I want you to know I love you for this. It's the coolest thing, Lord. I grinned all the way home. Called my wife and told her, laughed like a wild hyena. It was, I loved it. He said, I've been loving this. He said, it's helping me so much. He said, if I take off running, you catch this iPad because it's worth a lot of money and it's got a lot of scriptures on it, okay? <laughs> he said, I really think we need to have it Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night too. I 
I get home, I get home Amen. From, from prayer meeting last night, and I was a little bit upset. Not, not really, I was mad at the devil. Last night I found out I pastored a church full of chickens. <laughs> Hens and roosters. All I'm scared to pray. I get home, pull out this, get on Facebook. Lacey's got on there. I just went home, laid hands on every one of my kids and prayed for them. <laughs> they thought I was crazy. I'm about to, I'm about to have a fit. <laughs> Brother Pete, I wish it was all that easy. Huh? Oh, my goodness, it's unbelievable, huh? <laughs> so Sister Kim did it. Brother Terry did it. And then, and then Brother Mark told me, he said, before he told me he wanted to have prayer meeting for the rest of his life, he said, I just got through praying out loud, and it's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> Woo! You better look out, devil! We got some praying men and some praying women, and we got a bunch of new converts that don't know any better, and they believe everything we preach. I tell you what, I, I hope the new peer pressure starts wearing on up all the rest of us old fogies. Oh, Lord. Give me some high five right there, brother. Oh, it's awesome. It's unbelievable. Say, I don't know if it's a big deal. Let me tell you something. It's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. There's probably... Armies of angels standing at attention right now. Amen. Boy, I done lost. I'm, I may be in another message. Well, that's the trouble. I got to meet the sound man in here, and we got to go through everything tomorrow night. But uh, we may have it over at Brother Mark's house. <laughs> we're doing something. I don't know what, but we're doing something. And if any man sin, uh-oh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, let me, let me, let me show you something right now. Verse 2, I'm, I'm about done. I'm already over time, but I ain't scared. Boy, I got all these people behind me obeying, listening to what the Word says. I ain't afraid of that clock no more. I knew I took it down for a reason. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Notice this. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, you was about to ask me, some of you are wondering what's propitiation mean. I'm about to tell you. Propitiation means to make, a, to make amends for. It, it means a means whereby sin is covered. Now there are those that would preach and teach that Jesus Christ is steadily making intercession for us right now. It's not true. It's done. Brother Pete at Calvary. Ever sin that had ever been committed or was ever going to be committed was covered by the blood of Jesus. Say, I said all this stuff I said tonight to tell you this one thing. Here's how you have dominion over sin. There's no work for him left to do. It was done at Calvary. So if we sin, if we mess up and sin, what do we do? No, no, to put all this together now. What do we do? We take another trip to Calvary. And the sins that are in the whole world are just waiting 
completely submitted and subdued to be covered by the blood of Jesus. So God forbid that there one person under the sound of my voice that has been filled with the Holy Ghost or plans on being filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's a bunch of you. That not one more time for the rest of your life will one of your mistakes destroy you. If you realize as soon as you realize you did wrong, take it to Calvary. Take it to that old rugged cross. Soaked in the blood of Jesus Christ. God Almighty robed in the likeness of sinful flesh. The work has been done. Sin was defeated. It's still defeated. The only way sin is resurrected is when we allow it to be done that way through our bodies. It just needs to be reminded of the power of the blood. And the way I remind sin of the power of the blood, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted to thee. You repent. But listen to me. Here's what we got to learn to do. And I'm closing up. Here's we gotta, got what we got to learn to do. It's what happens in the beginning. The death the burial, and the resurrection. Okay, here's what we got to do. When we v revisit Calvary, we can't stop at the cross. Once we repent and our sins are forgiven, that's why it's so important you get baptized in Jesus' name because then you can remind the devil, it ain't the name GL I carry, it's the name Jesus. Get thee behind me. And then guess what? You take another trip to the tomb and the body's not there. Y'all remember this from Brother Woodward's message, but there's an angel at the head and an angel at the foot. And I'm once again at the mercy seat. And guess who's there? Let's stand. Guess who's there? A God that invested so much in me, he gave his life for me. How dare the devil try to sell us a lie that one of our mistakes is going to cause the Lord to turn his back on us when he invested his entire life in you. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it. He washed it. Why does snow? I know it's time to go, and I know some of you want to go to tasters, and, and some of you might want to stop it.